are in threat of being dissipated. Uh, if you want preservation of evidence, emergency relief, this process is where you can actually approach an institution and get that emergency more in line and more consistent with the party's agreement to arbitrate. Now, just to give you a run through as to how this procedure works, I've typically looked at the Singapore International Arbitration Center's rules and the HKIC's rules. So if you have that arbitration agreement in your contract and you've subscribed to the SIAC's rules or the HKIC's rules, both those rules provide for the emergency arbitrator procedure. And before the constitution of the tribunal, if you require emergency arbitration relief, you would first have to file an application to either HKIC or SIAC, depending on which institutional arbitration is commenced, and ask the institution to appoint an emergency arbitrator. Now, under SIAC, SIAC has to make that appointment within one day. HKIC has to make the appointment within two days. The emergency arbitrator has discretion as to how he'd like to conduct the proceedings. He could either conduct the proceedings on the basis of documentary evidence, or he could have an oral hearing. And in most cases, from my experience having administered proceedings, I've administered about eight emergency arbitrations. Uh, all eight cases have gone with an oral hearing. So in, in all those cases, parties have actually requested the emergency arbitrator that they wanted an oral hearing. And finally, the time limit under the rules is that an emergency arbitrator under SEAC rules has to render an emergency award within 14 days under the, CIA, under the HKIC rules, it's within 15 days. It's also notable that the decision of an emergency arbitrator, it ceases to be binding if the arbitration is not, if the arbitral tribunal is not constituted within 90 days of such order. But also remember that the emergency arbitrator comes in only for the purpose of granting emergency relief and then he steps out. He does not form part of the tribunal that is eventually constituted in an emergency arbitration. So he's just parachuted in to provide this service of providing interim relief, and then he steps out. Now, the key benefits of an emergency arbitration, if, if you want to choose this procedure, what are the big benefits that you get out of this? Number one is vis-a-vis -vis court. In court, if you're in an international arbitration, for the national court of that jurisdiction. So you would not necessarily get the neutrality or the independence that you would expect from the adjudication process. Emergency arbitrator is akin to the arbitral process. An independent, neutral arbitrator would be appointed by the institution. So that would be in line with the party's expectations to obtain neutrality from the process. Number two, uh, you, in an emergency arbitration, would get an arbitrator who is a sector specialist or a domain specialist, someone who has experience in the subject matter of the dispute, someone who has industry experience. So for instance, you got a dispute in oil and gas or shipping, um, the institution would look at the subject matter of that dispute and appoint an emergency arbitrator who has experience and who has the necessary qualifications in that industry. This is again a post court where you could have a judge who's not a specialist dealing with an emergency application. So in, in my opinion, this is another benefit that you'd get out of the emergency arbitrator process as institutions look at um, domain expertise before appointing an emergency arbitrator. Confidentiality is another big benefit which you would not get from going to court for interim relief because as you know, um, going to court for interim relief, it's the, the, the proceedings are open to the public so if you or your clients are concerned about confidentiality obligations, uh, you're probably better off getting that from an emergency arbitration but the obligations are protected. And of course, the exception of Hong Kong is that if you have an arbitration agreement, even arbitration-related court proceedings are confidential, but it doesn't necessarily hold true in other jurisdictions. And as I mentioned before, um, in principle, emergency arbitration is consistent with the party's agreement to avoid courts, so you will get that facility from the process. Uh, the other key benefit is that in an international arbitration, you might want to use a wide range of counsel. You might prefer your home counsel. If you're a US company, you probably want a US lawyer arguing before uh, an emergency arbitration. But if you're gonna to go to court, you have to, you're constrained to use local counsel. You need locally qualified lawyers to argue before ancillary related court proceedings. But in, in an emergency arbitration, you have the right to choose foreign lawyers 
So you've got a wide pool of counsel you can actually choose from who can make that advocacy before an emergency arbitrator. Now obviously there are limitations, uh, as you can see the benefits, there are also key limitations to this process. But I'll hand this over to Dennis, who will give you a take on it. Thank you, editor. Um, bit of confusion there, almost in the vein of uh, Morgan Wise. Um, I'm slightly the iconoclast uh, in that Adit has been saying how wonderful that emergency arbitrator procedures are. I'm going to flag up some of my concerns around the emergency arbitrator procedure. As we all know, it is trite that one of the advantages of arbitration is it gives you control over who is going to be your court, your arbitrator. And yet we've heard that in, in emergency arbitrator applications you have no control. It's taken away from the parties and it's given to the institution. Secondly, the emergency arbitrator procedure within institutions is not ex parte. One of the great advantages of the nuclear weapons of litigation, Moravas and Anton Pillars, or as they're rather depressingly referred to in England now, freezing orders and search and seizure, is that they can be done very quickly. And they are ex parte, they're stealth applications. Uh, so the court, the arbitration procedure, it can be slow, it's not one particularly of stealth, and therefore uh, any assets or evidence you're trying to protect could well have been dissipated or destroyed before you get to it. So if you are seated in a jurisdiction which has a robust and efficient court system, such as Singapore, London, Hong Kong, then really going to court probably makes more sense. It's more expensive. Um, you only pay a filing fee if you go to court, whereas if you go to the institution, you pay the institution, commercial court judge in Hong Kong has a penal notice attached to it. So, you have a Moravia injunction and you've gone to the HKIAC and obtained it from an emergency arbitrator eventually. <coughs> you rock up at Standard Charter Bank and present it and say, this is a designated account of the bad guys, uh, please freeze it. And the counsel at the Standard Charter Bank is going to look at this piece of paper and go, hmm, that's impressive, never heard of this guy never heard of this contract, don't know what you're talking about. On the other hand, I've got a mandate from a customer which says get the money out of Hong Kong and send it to the Cook Islands. What's he going to do? He's going to send it to the Cook Islands. Compare and contrast, you've got a Moravia injunction from commercial court judge with a penal notice. He will obey it because he doesn't really want to go and spend time in Stanley prison. The risks. As these are touched upon, there is the potential inefficiency and delay of the institution, and certainly I've touched upon that in the appointment of the emergency arbitrator. The counterpoint is that the times that are given, set out in the institution's rules around emergency arbitrators are not particularly helpful in their cause, because they suggest a long period of time to get things done. As I've touched upon in a court driven up Moreva, you can get instructions at 10 in the morning, be in front of the judge at 3.30 in the afternoon and it's job done, the money's frozen. And yet it seems from the timetable set out by the institutions it can be a rather lengthy process. It would help, in my view, if the institutions were more transparent and they publish up, published, publicised um, exactly how long it takes an emergency arbitrator to, to do his thing. And there's the potential of non-enforcement of emergency arbitrator's decisions and awards in other jurisdictions. They don't have, generally, the imprimatur of the New York Convention. There are many jurisdictions, including, I think, India takes the view that an emergency arbitrator's order is just that, and therefore doesn't qualify as a final award under the Convention, and therefore it really will be ignored here. <coughs> um, that's probably, it sounds worse than it is, because if you think about it, a court order a court-driven Moravia injection will equally be ignored here when we have to go and get uh, a domestic uh, Moravia in aid of the Hong Kong arbitration. So it's probably a neutral point, um, but it's not one that should be forgotten. Adita, back to you. Right, so to give you an idea as to how this procedure has been used in Asia, we will we'll give you two examples, notably in Singapore and in Hong Kong. 
Now, SISC introduced the emergency arbitrator procedure and its rules in 2010. These, uh, the, the, the provision of emergency arbitration was retrospective. And since its inception, uh, SIAC has received, up to now, 53 emergency applications. Uh, a good majority of them have actually been used by Indian parties. And the HKIAC introduced the emergency arbitrator provision in its rules in November 20. China, um, as you know, the institutional ad hoc arbitration is not permitted in China, and it's purely institutional arbitration. Um, the Chinese civil procedure law does not allow the institution to hear the emergency arbitration application. So if you do have an application for interim relief under the civil procedure law of China, the chairman of the arbitral institution or the subcommission has to forward that emergency application to the relevant court of the competent jurisdiction. And China has not made any legislative amendments to recognize uh, the emergency arbitrator or the award of an emergency arbitrator, so it's simply not enforceable in China. But CTAC has introduced this provision in its rules, and it's uh, obviously intended to give and therefore, again, because the, the whole question of the emergency arbitrator's award or uh, order is not something that is in the nature of finality, uh, it is again not possible to be enforced in Japan. Coming to India, the, the emergency arbitrator uh, concept did receive some treatment in the Law Commission of India's report, number 246, taking into account the emergency arbitrator and that into the amendments. But for some strange reason, and uh, I, I don't know why it did not actually get into legislation, but the Indian Arbitration Amendment Act in 2015 does not talk about the emergency. There is no legislative recognition to emergency arbitration in India. However, there are two cases, and this will shed some light as to how the, the high courts in India have treated uh, awards of a emergency arbitration arbitrator and foreign seated arbitration. So you take the HSBC Holdings versus Avitel in 2014. Uh, it was a foreign seated arbitration and uh, the, the party got interim relief from the emergency arbitrator in Singapore, uh, came to enforce that award in India uh, to effectively restrain the other party from withdrawing <coughs> amounts in a bank account. And the other party was not complying with it. So that the party who received the award in its favor went to the Bombay High Court and applied to the High Court under Section 9 of the Indian Arbitration Act. Uh, so the Bombay High Court effectively passed an order under Section 9, uh, giving the interim relief in terms similar to that, which, to that of the Emergency uh, Arbitrator's Award. So effectively, it indirectly enforced the Emergency Arbitrator's Award. But the Delhi High Court, most recently last year, in the Raffles Design, uh, uh, Raffles Design High Court case, uh, said that, held that the order or award of a foreign seated emergency arbitrator is not enforceable in India. And it said that you cannot go under Section 9 to enforce the award of an emergency arbitrator. But the court said that you can independently approach the High Court under Section 9 to independently determine the application for interim relief. However, when, when uh, th th this was actually observations by the Delhi High Court when it was dealing with a question on maintainability of the Section 9 application, it is still to consider the merits of the case. So it still remains to be seen whether it will act similar to the Bombay High Court and grant relief uh, in terms similar to the, to the Emergency Arbitrator's Award. So the position with the courts, again, is very unclear. So you would think twice before um, bring, before choosing to opt for emergency arbitration because the enforceability in India remains uncertain. So what are the key considerations really? So as, as I spoke about before, you have to think about the benefits um, and then have to balance that with the limitations to the process. So if you do think that there are significant benefits, is this an effective remedy? If the answer to that is yes, for instance, yes, I, you know, I, I do not want to get ex parte relief. I do want confidentiality. If all those are key considerations, then look at whether the jurisdiction in which you're going to enforce this award is enforceable. And if it is, also consider whether the institutional rules that you've subscribed to, does that institution, is it a credible institution? What is their track record in appointing an emergency arbitrator? If they're going to take more than two days, then it defeats the whole 
swiftness of the remedy. HKIC, in my opinion, when I was working there, in all eight cases, they were very efficient in terms of taking just six hours to appoint the emergency arbitrator from receiving the emergency application. But institutions have to be more forthcoming in disclosing uh, statistics as to how long they take in appointing an emergency arbitrator, because that will give you as practitioners a fair idea uh, as to whether you know, that's a suitable remedy, or if they do take too long, then of course you're better off in court, because the ultimate benefit here is to get a remedy as quickly as possible. So these are the considerations that you should keep in mind before thinking about whether you want to initiate an emergency arbitration. Thank you, Rita. This slide does no more than show, in terms of pie charts, the, uh, the rise of the Asia-based uh, institutions, HKIC in Singapore, now rivaling, rivaling globally the likes of the ICC and the LCIA. We just want to use these few minutes to ask whether there's any questions arising from what Adita has said, or indeed what I've said. Any questions? I ask that with some trepidation, bearing in mind we are keeping you away from the coffee. Um, well, either... Ah, question. remedy. Uh, what's the position with the appointment of an emergency arbitrator? Uh, has any practice developed as to undertakings as to damages in that regard? Uh, I'm unaware specifically of an answer to that. I would expect, bearing in mind the nature of the people who are appointed as emergency arbitrators, they will track commercial court practice, both in particularly Hong Kong and Singapore, and require fortified undertakings and losses and the like. But Adita, any experience in the awards you've seen? I haven't seen any yet. So either it wasn't asked for and then we didn't get it, or they asked for it and they didn't get it. But I, I don't know. It is all, I, that lends itself again to being an advantage in going to court okay. in respect to the respondents by any institution holding the respondents' funds. Why would the uh, specific advantage of having a provision for emergency arbitration in an act as opposed to just having it in the institutional arbitration rules? Is there any specific advantage in having a clause relating to emergency arbitration in an act? Because I was part of the law commission report and we had recommended that. But the government wasn't very keen to incorporate on the basis that this was all party autonomy and therefore it's better that it is left to the party parties want, they can have emergency arbitration. So what, what would be the advantage in having it in the law? Because <coughs> the Arbit Indian Arbitration Act, uh, part two, that deals with the enforcement of foreign arbitral awards, specifically states that final arbitral awards will be enforced in India. And the nature of an emergency arbitrator's award is not final. And therefore, that is why you actually need a legislative amendment to the Arbitration Act to recognize the emergency arbitrator's award as recognizable in India. But why would the uh, emergency arbitration award not be uh, not be recognized? I mean, it's still an award, and even an interim <coughs> award is recognized under the provisions of the Arbitration Act. You can file an application for executing even an interim award. When that's the case, why would an emergency uh, arbitral award not be recognized by court? It's an award. But this is a foreign seated arbitration, and under the New York Convention, again, only final awards are enforceable. So you need to necessarily bring that amendment to the Arbitration Act to give it the teeth of enforceability. That's what Hong Kong and Singapore have also done. You can have a contractual provision, and you can subscribe to the institutional rules that provide for that provision. But if your legislation does not allow for the enforcement, because again, India, being a signatory of the New York Convention, only recognizes the, final, the finality of the award, uh, which in this case is not possible. So that's why it is necessary that Parliament actually amends the Act to bring this, uh, to, to give effect to this provision. 